Well, good morning. My name is Michael Sieblin, and I'm a senior technologist in NASA's Science Mission Directorate in Washington. Today, I'd like to discuss some of our recent activities for advancing autonomous systems capabilities for future NASA science missions. Okay, so a little bit about uh, the Science Mission Directorate, SMD. Um, by the numbers, we operate 105 uh, spacecraft missions. Of those, uh, in addition to those, I should say, uh, 47 are small satellite under 180 kilogram, which uh, provides for us cost-effective uh, science missions. 27 of those are technology demonstrations. We have a balloon uh, program, which uh, has provided 46 uh, science payloads, um, four of which are uh, student-directed. Uh, uh, Sounding rocket program, uh, 38 science missions, two of which are student uh, technology directed. In the Earth Science Division, we have an airborne uh, uh, program which uh, focuses on uh, scientific field campaigns. We've had 25 of those recently, um, uh, major airborne missions. Um, uh, and those also provide for uh, uh, testing new technologies. Technology development overall in SMD is roughly half a billion dollar investment annually, half of which is uh, through competed programs. We have about 15 of those. And then the rest is uh, technology development in the later stages um, for use by uh, flight missions. And then research and analysis, we support over 10,000 investigators across the US with a budget of over uh, half a billion dollars a year. The Science Mission Directorate is comprised of six major divisions, Earth Science, Heliophysics, Planetary Science, Astrophysics, Biological and Physical Sciences, and the Joint Agency Satellite Division. From a technology perspective, we consider the needs of the divisions first and holistically. Uh, we optimize our investments by making certain that they address cross-cutting requirements uh, wherever possible. Our science requirements are largely stated in the foundational documents that are derived from the National Academies, which are the decadal surveys for our major uh, research divisions. From the perspective of strategic technology investments, we map the long-term science measurement requirements uh, to the capabilities and determine where there are gaps. Um, we invest in technology development uh, through our 15 separate programs across the directorate. Um, those target mostly uh, science instrument development um, and also information systems technology. For spacecraft platform technologies, which include power systems, thermal management, communications, propulsion, et cetera, uh, we rely on NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate to make investments that benefit not only SMD, but the entire agency. Autonomy is important to all of our divisions, and because it is comprised of a combination of instrument technology, platform technology, and uh, information technology, it doesn't quite fit our, our organizational structure, unfortunately. <clears throat> so today, um, I'll focus on just two of the divisions um, when providing uh, examples. Um, Earth science and planetary science, um, given that we have limited time. However, it's important to note that uh, we are actively uh, pursuing applications for advanced autonomy in all of our research divisions. We'll start with planetary science. Uh, first, um, the overarching science questions that we want to address, and again, this comes directly from the most recent uh, planetary science decadal survey. Uh, there are three core themes, uh, building new worlds, planetary habitats, and the workings of the inner uh, of the uh, solar system. The key science questions are centered on origin and makeup of the solar system, um, its evolution to into its current uh, configuration, the possibility of life uh, within the solar system, which could be one of the the great discoveries of the century, both past and present. Um, and by understanding other bodies in the solar system, we can better under, understand our home planet. Um, <clears throat> so these questions help guide the ultimate destination uh, we choose to explore uh, with an individual mission. 
Obviously, autonomy is critical to the success of missions that need to operate in harsh environments and which have limited communication uh, links uh, back to Earth. Okay, so for planning purposes, the technology development is performed with the agency's official manifest in mind. It operates as a constraint on our prioritization. So for example, um, in the manifest you see here, uh, the agency has a Europa lander mission penciled in for 2033. Now, just because the manifest exists, it doesn't mean that um, it will be executed as such. The, the funding, uh, the budget lines are not available for those uh, out years yet. Um, this is simply a snapshot in time of our best guess for the missions that might occur over the next uh, decade or two. So it's used just for planning purposes. Um, but the Europa lander as a possible flagship mission, and the flagship missions are those that are with the orange uh, squares, um, that means that SMD needs to have a solid plan for the types of autonomy and autonomous systems that such a mission uh, might require. Uh, we also expect that new technologies uh, be matured well in advance of launch. So our rule of thumb is typically five years um, in advance of of, of emissions. So that really leaves us just seven years uh, to address any critical technology gaps that might be needed for, um, you know, for example, a Europa lander mission. And there are other missions uh, on the manifest. The directed missions, again, are in orange. The competed missions, which come through um, uh, announcements of opportunity through our discovery and new frontiers programs, we don't know what those missions are going to be. Um, but they could offer uh, uh, possibilities for infusing new technologies in autonomous systems, for example, or for testing new, new uh, technologies. Um, uh, the Psyche mission, which uh, will launch in a couple of years, um, going to a, a metal asteroid, um, it, will, it will be going by Mars. And, and when it does that, we have a payload on board called the Deep Space Optical Comm Unit it'll test high speed uh, communications in space. So another good reason to, to lay this out on the manifest is to show where we might have um, opportunities for maturing technologies. And then um, the chart also shows some other types of technology gaps besides autonomy that, that are um, uh, important. Um, for earth science, uh, here's a comparable list of uh, science measurement requirements, along with candidate approaches to the types of instruments uh, that would most likely be used by these uh, missions. The so-called designated observables uh, that are shown in the diagram, these are, have the highest priority. Um, and there are other categories as well, which I, I won't show you um, uh, with uh, time uh, as a constraint. Uh, but we'll look at how autonomy might be used uh, for some of these missions. Again, we, we can look at the manifest. Um, uh, for the primary missions, in this case, the designated observables, <clears throat> um, along with other strategic missions, we, we identify the anticipated technologies and map them accordingly. So what you see here is a mapping to mostly instrument technologies. Um, so in terms of planning, we make sure the strategic missions are supported uh, first and foremost. Again, this is a draft, it's subject to change, and that's particularly true for earth science, which is currently engaged in studies to determine the priorities of its uh, decadal survey missions. Uh, the purpose here is to show that there's a strategy and that our technology programs are responsible for executing the strategy. Um, I've shown a small subset of the technology investments we're making in the DOs, um, and these technologies are also available for the competed missions, which are represented by the Earth Venture uh, line. Um, and you can see the, uh, the cadence of those solicitations as well. And again, those offer us the possibility for uh, performing flight demonstrations. Okay, so that's the background on what the requirements look like, where they come from, how we address them. Um, in the past five years, the agency has recognized that uh, a couple of important things related to autonomy. First, uh, NASA is not in the lead um, compared to industry and academia. 
So um, we need to figure out how we're going to partner with, um, with those two entities. <clears throat> and second, we have a risk averse culture uh, that makes infusion of new technologies like autonomy, um, uh, in some cases, torturously slow. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how that, that comes to be in the agency. So in 2016, uh, Mr. Uh, Robert Lightfoot, who was our associate administrator at the time, directed the establishment of a new capability area in autonomous systems with the purpose of coordinating and uh, consolidating the investments across not only multiple centers, but also across the mission directorates uh, at headquarters. Dr. Terry Fong was named the capability lead for autonomous systems. Now, just in case in the terminology, I, I think we need to, to discuss uh, for just a second. Um, we use the term autonomy uh, in this sense. It's the ability to achieve goals while operating independently from external control. Uh, autonomous system is that which exhibits some level of autonomy. And a system is simply a combination of elements that function together to produce a, a given capability. Could be software, hardware, humans, um, et cetera, whatever it takes. So uh, Terry Fong, uh, we worked with Terry um, in 2017 and 2018 um, in his new leadership uh, role uh, to conduct two science-focused autonomy workshops. So these workshops were, were directed at, uh, strictly at the needs of, of the Science Mission Directorate. Uh, our first workshop was held at NASA Ames in 2017. It was part of, uh, it was kind of the last day of the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute survey uh, workshop. Um, so it was like a one day um, affair. But in 2018, we held a, we convened a larger uh, standalone event that was two days long um, in Pittsburgh. And we partnered with the SETI Institute and Carnegie Mellon University um, on the workshop, we had 90 leaders from government, academia, and industry. Uh, we were able to visit some of the um, robotics uh, companies that uh, are in uh, Pittsburgh. It's very impressive uh, uh, what they've done. Um, so um, the workshops were really designed uh, to connect our key scientists, our program managers and the technologists who are involved in autonomous systems, bring them together um, uh, and um, uh, looking ahead at the next 10 to 15 years, we wanted to identify uh, what areas in autonomous systems are, are emerging that would be useful, that could enable or enhance uh, science capabilities of our missions and, uh, and also reduce uh, cost and risk. So in advance of the workshop, we convened eight teams. Uh, they were comprised of both scientists and technologists and engineers. Uh, and they helped to conceive of missions that would be bolder than those that uh, have been proposed today. So it's a situation where the scientists will propose um, very conservative missions because they want them to get through the proposal review process. If uh, a proposal is um, suggesting a lot of new technologies, such as autonomous systems, it could get flagged as being high risk and rejected. So we as the program managers need to understand where we need to retire the risk in the technology investments so they can be used by the missions with, um, without fear that, uh, that they will, will suffer a rejection. Um, so why is autonomy uh, developing slowly within the agency? So some interesting re revelations at the, uh, the 2018 workshop. Um, we heard from Rob Manning, who's a senior engineer from JPL. He's been involved with uh, many of the flagship planetary missions over the decades. Um, provide, and he provided a history of autonomous systems and how they've evolved um, at NASA. So in the early years, the 1970s, you know, it was mostly uh, automation, not autonomy. So you're just executing things in steps, um, implemented with the goal of having a, they wanted deterministic uh, systems. Um, 
And again, we're talking about spacecraft that were very expensive and, and they didn't want to take a lot of risks. And there weren't many of them. So uh, there weren't a lot of, of opportunities for uh, trial and error. It wasn't until the 1980s that we had acceptance of non-deterministic systems. Um, uh, for example, attitude control, which was one of the early ones added, <clears throat> was allowed to cycle slip and, and reliance on a common clock, um, you know, common synchronized spacecraft time was ended. Uh, computing, of course, um, exploded in the 1990s, and so COTS uh, products uh, were, were introduced for the first time. Now you had multiple clocks uh, with bounded uh, time execution. That requirement, bounded time execution, was lifted after the turn of the century, um, but the order of execution was, was still preserved. Today, uh, more recently, the systems are more complex. We now have rovers um, <clears throat> and we have helicopters. We have two uh, missions now that are, are doing rudimentary autonomy uh, for uh, uh, exploration of Mars on Mars 2020 persever Perseverance and also the uh, Dragonfly mission to uh, a Titan. Um, so breakthroughs in, in autonomous systems really didn't occur until we had a technology demonstration mission. Um, this was the Deep Space One mission in the late 1990s. This was operated under the New Millennium Program, which was a technology demonstration mission program. Um, and the missions under that program were focused primarily on uh, maturing technology and the science delivery was secondary. So because of that, we had two uh, key breakthroughs in autonomy. We had the remote intelligent agent software, uh, which allowed for remote planning and uh, opportunistic science uh, capabilities, and also autonomous nav navigation. AutoNav was introduced through uh, DS1. Um, unfortunately, the program was uh, ended in uh, 2008, and so our ability to fly those types of uh, technology demonstrations uh, it, today is somewhat limited. <clears throat> so just other observations, um, uh, autonomy in, in, in uh, planetary science in particular was introduced to maintain a safe state, not to enhance science. There are some missions like gamma ray burst detectors that are really focused on the science, but for the most part, the autonomous systems that have been introduced to date are really for the health and safety of the spacecraft. Uh, we didn't have attitude control until Galileo in 1989. Cassini um, was the first spacecraft to know its position in the solar system with the guidance control system. Um, and then state definitions and state planning were introduced more recently, uh, mostly to help with uh, fault recovery. Um, rovers required the addition of a more complex uh, fault recovery, um, but Again, not so much for uh, science enhancement. Terrain relative navigation is the first, um, first of its kind. So Mars 2020 is the first spacecraft to really be able to see uh, where it's going to be landing and for the, the uh, navigation system to, to help guide it. Um, and that'll be developed uh, with the follow-on system over the next few years. Um, so for, to get uh, you know, science, true science enhancements through autonomy. We need onboard models, we need computing, uh, we need an understanding of the internal state. So we have a lot of work to do. <clears throat> okay, so for the design reference missions that uh, came out of the workshop, and again, I'm not gonna talk about all of these, um, but we had eight. Um, we instructed the groups again to uh, throw the Hail Mary pass, go bold, think outside the box, all of that. Um, the planetary science division uh, dominated. They were represented in five out of the eight groups. Um, by the very nature, um, the, the concept of operations there were very challenging due to distance from the, from the, from the ground, from earth um, and harsh environmental conditions, uh, radiation around Europa, the ice, um, um, uh, these missions that went to Venus, Moon, Mars, small bodies and ocean worlds, heliophysics and astrophysics and Earth 
also had design reference missions, the Helio and the Earth missions were mostly about space weather and terrestrial weather applications. Um, of the uh, 11 planetary mission concepts that were funded through studies by planetary science back in 2017, this was an RFI that, that came out to talk about uh, future uh, science missions. Um, uh, and and they're, they're being used by the 2023 Decadal Survey. Five of those specified um, autonomy uh, in the proposal and one suggested um, navigation to the target through aero capture, which also requires autonomy. <clears throat> okay, so a couple of examples here. Um, I, I, I'm gonna talk about Earth and one example from Earth and one from planetary. So in Earth science, um, and again, this, this goes back a ways, there've been a lot of plans, um, but we're still not quite to the point of, of flying um, something, but, but we've, we've uh, been planning these dynamic data-driven application systems, uh, DDAS, uh, for more than 10 years. And this is a symbiotic, uh, you know, the, the assets that fly in space are working in concert with a numerical model on the ground or with humans on the ground. Could be disaster managers um, that want uh, uh, certain uh, features targeted and the evolution of those features uh, tracked um, in real time. So today, where, where we happen to uh, collect data from satellites, wherever the, ha the satellite happens to pass, the goal here is to direct the assets to target specific features in the atmosphere or the ocean um, so that we get um, a more defined, uh, you know, like a, 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 a science uh, campaign. Um, the Earth Science Technology Office uh, came up with this uh, sensor web concept. It's now called the New Observing Strategy um, over the last 10 years or so. The A-Train is a simple example of how, um, uh, you know, how a, a, a very simple case of this might work, where the, the assets are flying uh, close together, the, there's a common science theme across the measurements. Um, there's, you know, some station keeping there to make sure that they don't get too close, to make sure that, that the measurement boxes are, are aligned correctly. So we've started this process, but what we really want to do is target um, specific features of the atmosphere. These assets might look off nadir or go into rapid scan mode um, on the fly. The definition of a sensor web was a coherent set of distributed nodes, so it doesn't have to be spacecraft, it could be aircraft or buoys at sea even. <clears throat> uh, interconnected by some type of communications fabric that collectively behave as a single highly adaptive observing system. So I've been showing this example for a number of years, uh, but I, I think it's still useful. Um, this is a, um, a simple case of a sensor web with with two assets. This would be, uh, in this example, we had a wind LIDAR and we had a spacecraft that uh, flew ahead of the wind LIDAR. Um, so the, the LIDAR is sampling uh, tropospheric uh, winds. The leader spacecraft is designed to inform the LIDAR of where there are clouds or other, you know, where it might not be practi practical to uh, make a measurement. And then you can power the LIDAR down uh, to preserve power and life. Um, so to, to just take a look at uh, how this would work, um, the, the LIDAR is, uh, is in a normal observing mode with the, the blue. Um, it's flying over, um, mod so what you see on the surface of the globe here is model output um, from the NASA GS5 model. And the colored regions on the surface of the globe there are regions where we're getting error growth in the numerical model forecast. So we wanna target those regions with extra observations. So when the LIDAR flies over those regions, it goes into a rapid scan mode. We get extra data and these tracks change from blue to green like you see here. Um, so we, we optimize uh, where we need to collect data. Now, sometimes the data is off nadir, so the, the spacecraft can slew to the right or swing over and slew to the left. 
and we can capture those regions and then it'll return to its, its normal nadir state. The goal here again is to uh, help reduce the error growth in the system. So the, the model is directing the collection of the, the measurements, the, um, the LIDAR is being optimized with the leader spacecraft telling it where, um, where it shouldn't take measurements. Um, and um, so it, it's a completely optimized system with the hope that the uh, predictive skill of the, of the uh, forecast will be uh, improved. For planetary science, we have a, a mission called the Europa Cryobot Explorer. So Europa and other icy moons uh, may harbor life in the oceans that exist under these thick icy crusts, which could be upwards of 10 kilometers deep. Um, the key science goals here are, you know, in terms of geodynamics, what's the structure and the dynamic state of the icy crust and the ocean surface? And then the interesting questions are habitability and life detection. So uh, do, do the ocean world's uh, past or present state uh, provide the necessary environments to support life? And then did life actually emerge um, either in the past? Does life exist there today? Again, discovery of the century. <clears throat> so this represents one of the biggest, uh, one of the grandest challenge, um, I believe in terms of uh, a mission with um, uh, full autonomy. Um, so there has to be a landing commissioning and deployment phase. So the spacecraft um, lands on the, on the surface. It has to penetrate the ice. It has to perhaps find a, a, an area where the ice is thin, a crevasse or, or um, some other uh, way to, to penetrate the ice. Um, there has to be communications established um, underneath the surface. Um, we wanna be able to uh, investigate that interface between the ice and the water. Um, so there has to be some, some way of identifying that and then in, in exploring it and then communicating the results. Um, and then um, into the ocean itself, there has to be a deployment of a probe uh, to make measurements and to, to look for life. So this can't be controlled uh, from the ground. This has to be um, uh, uh, an autonomous, um, opportunistic science investigation. It has to be thoroughly tested and vetted. Um, so it, like I said, this would represent a grand challenge for a uh, planetary uh, explorer. Okay, so we summarized the, uh, the key technology gaps that we found across the um, eight design reference missions. We saw these recurring themes. That's a good thing because uh, budgets are limited. We make investments in one area, they benefit uh, many. Um, these themes drive the derived autonomy challenges and functional capabilities. Um, we could see that um, you know, the DRMs were either operating on or near a body or planetary surface, moon, Mars, Venus, small bodies, earth, ocean worlds, all of those, um, or venturing into bodies onto a small body or on the moon, uh, for example, in a lava tube, a European crevasse, uh, coordinating <clears throat> Heterogeneous assets, uh, constellations of spacecraft, like in the example I showed you for Earth science. Um, the Venus design reference mission, very elaborate. So it called for single mission calling for orbiters, a lander, balloon, drop, drop sons, and small spacecraft, all to get to do a, a thorough uh, a science investigation of the atmosphere, the surface, and the interior of Venus. Um, and something similar uh, for Mars as well. <clears throat> but obviously because of the atmosphere, the difference in the atmosphere and the conditions on the surface, um, you know, the, the, uh, the mission operations be quite different. Um, and also for Mars preparing for uh, human exploration in advance. So I've listed some of the challenges of the functional capabilities here. We'll use this information uh, to establish programs if necessary and make the necessary investments for the future missions. Um, and then just kind of a final look at the takeaways. Um, 
Autonomy is both uh, functional, uh, function specific and cross domain. So we, we have to just keep establishing these design reference missions. Destination is critically important, but the mission architecture is as well. Uh, concept of operations, uh, very important. You can't really in, make an investment in autonomy without having some design reference, some set of de design ref reference missions. And that's what we tried to do with these workshops. My feeling is that there uh, should be another workshop, perhaps in the 2022 timeframe, to kind of see where we're heading, how the, the DRMs have evolved, um, how the priorities may have changed um, since that time, um, how the technologies have evolved, et cetera. Uh, the common things, themes and recurring functions, uh, like we said, have emerged. Um, so, and I've, I've listed them here. So these are broad areas where we would want to make some investments. This could be done through uh, solicitations, through broad agency announcements, or through prizes and challenges uh, to engage the, the community. Um, space applications are uniquely challenging. And I think that one of the key elements of autonomous systems, which would be uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, those have to be uh, nurtured as well. Uh, the, the onboard uh, computing, you know, we're not going to be able to do this with a RAD 750 uh, processor. Uh, fortunately, the Space Technology Mission Directorate is investing in advanced uh, computing, but we may need another generation. So it may be uh, neuromorphic on the edge. It may be in a, in a high radiation environment. Those types of things that are uh, unique to NASA, we, we're going to have to be looking at that as well. So that's where we are. Um, those were kind of the takeaways that we had from the workshop. Um, if you're interested, we would uh, be happy to talk with you further. Um, and also um, uh, for the upcoming workshop in 22, we anticipate there will be a workshop. Um, we invite your participation and um, uh, look forward to, to discussing further. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you uh, found this to be useful.